Welcome to the Shelf Oddities. My name is Eerie, and the oddity that I'm feeling this week is a pickle jar full of wet specimen sheep eyeballs that may or may not be sealed. <laughs> Wonderful. And I'm Serafina, and the oddity I'm really vibing with this week is that envelope of bundles of first haircuts you found in your basement from a family that has never lived in your home. That sounds very haunted. Yeah. Pretty <laughs> gross, but kind of fun. Kind of fun. Memories. Potentially cursed. Yeah. Well, you know. Everything is, really. Very true. Um, and welcome to our fist first official our episode <laughs> <laughs> of Oddity Arcadia. Um, to kick us off, we wanted to talk about how we are structuring our episodes. Yeah. This episode is what we would consider a death episode, which is done by me, you Eerie, focused, yeah. me focused. And then there's life episodes, which is me focused. And the plan is to alternate between life and death, each of us having our own topics. And of course, because life and death always intersect at some point, there will be some episodes where you're going to hear from both of us at the same time. But for the most part, you're going to hear us go back and forth telling each other things that we are obsessed with that week and what's new in that kind of genre for us. So this week, Eerie, what are you hyper fixating on? I am hyper fixating on the history of taxidermy. Mm. Um, as we both know, I got into um, the whole oddity community and being interested in oddities over the last couple years. Yeah. Uh, that's one of those found it during quarantine, <laughs> like most people the found COVID many hobby. things, the COVID hobby, and fell madly in love, taxidermy yeah. being one of those things, so I figured we would start us off right yeah, by excited. talking about some dead animals. Wow. Wonderful. So I'm going to hop right in. Please do. Um, my intro and description that we're here is a direct copy paste from Wikipedia to give them credit, so okay. I'm going to read it as it was written on Wikipedia because I like how it was written. We love so. plagiarism at its finest. Hey. Credit, credit where credit's due. Credit Let's go. Credit's I'm due. ready. So taxidermy, or the process of preserving animal skin together with its feathers, fur, or scales, is an art whose existence has been short compared to forms such as painting, sculpture, and music. The word derives from two Greek words, taxis, meaning order, preparation, and arrangement, and derma, meaning skin. Directly translated, taxidermy means skin art which I did not know and loved as soon as I read it for the first time. I didn't know that either. And like the derma part is so obviously skin, but never did I put that together. That's so interesting. Exactly. Yeah. So thanks Wikipedia. Um, I'm going to do a timeline, jump kind of at oldest taxidermy to where we are at with taxidermy in modern times. So as with most fun and wonderful things, we're starting in ancient Egypt. (laughs) Uh, yes. Which I, tracks. <laughs> I definitely researched something like that this week, too, and it always leads back to the Egyptians. Always. So grateful. Of course. Um, so the earliest known taxidermists were the ancient Egyptians, and despite the fact that they never removed skins from animals as a whole, it was the Egyptians who developed one of the world's earliest forms of animal preservation through the use of injections, spices, oils, and other embalming tools. So they basically did early forms of embalming. Um, as early as... 2200 BC, wow. the old timies, uh, they embalmed the bodies of dogs, cats, monkeys, birds, sheep, oxen, which oxen. was interesting, um, and any other pets of Egyptian Egyptian royalty and buried them in their pharaoh's tomb. Well, they mummified cats, right? right. Yep. So this is just like an, another step up from that? Yeah. Um, wow. Well, actual embalming of those animals yeah. Yeah, so that they were preserved in the tomb. Wow. Um, though these people did not seek to preserve animals for modeling like we would do for regular, uh, regular, like taxidermy, regular. Regular. normal taxidermy, <laughs> normal. as, because it's so normal, as they might appear in, like, a natural setting, the ancient Egyptians' ability to preserve the carcasses of animals as immense as a hippopotamus. No way. Yes. They preserved a hippopotamus. That's right. A mummy of which, which was discovered in Thebes. Really? Yes. Of a full so hippopotamus. Cool. I want, I... We might include pictures of that on our Instagram. I was going to say, I need to see that. Because that's incredible. Um, So 
that's kind of the basics of Egypt. While we're talking about ancient Egypt, I figured this would be a great time to mention the mummy um, because... As in the movie? <laughs> as in the movie. You should always be mentioning the mummy, that's so I'm why, in it. Yeah. That's why I wanted to mention it, uh, because my love of ancient Egypt definitely came from the mummy, mm. um, and also is definitely why I'm gay. Uh, yeah, I definitely wanted to be a librarian. Same. I'm glad that I have thicker eyebrows, though. I think that <laughs> that would not fit my face. But yes, she, uh, she they definitely were killing it. killed it. Killing it. Yeah. Awesome. Icons. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so moving on to early preservation of animal hides, which I think is one of the... Tr- I don't ever think of that as a form of taxidermy for some reason, um, but it really is. Well, when you look at the word. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 You're 100%. Skin art. That is skin art. For sure. Um, So, animal hide. This form of taxidermy was popular in Europe and with um, Native American societies, which is super rad. Mm -hmm. Um, They have a lot of really cool, really cool art and hide preserving. So, the skins and hides of animals were preserved and used for a wide range of purposes, including clothing and bedding. Um, Some early societies also preserved animal hides for cultural or religious purposes. So, yeah. Yeah. Moving on to the Dark Ages. Uh, This is when we started having renewed development and new techniques for taxidermy. So during the Dark Ages, the interest in taxidermy declined due to a rise in technological advances and the rapid decline of needing to tan hides. But in the 1400s, people took a renewed interest in the art of taxidermy. This was the start of the Renaissance and Scientific Revolution, which lasted into the 1600s. So not only were people interested in preserving animal skins and hides, but also in recreating the lifelike representation of animals as a form of art. Hmm. It was during this time that early museums also started to become interested in creating displays featuring a wide range of wild animals for people to see up close. So um, in the Netherlands in the 1600s, the first attempts were made to preserve and mount birds, which birds are like the craziest taxonomy to me because it's not like they have a whole hide they have individual like the feathers yeah there's a lot more detail so the first large-scale animal mounted was in the 1500s at the royal museum in florence italy where they used taxidermy techniques of the time to create a rhinoceros display no way which that's like the big that's like a hippo i mean size wise that's wild yeah yeah And then um, in Switzerland in the 1600s, the Museum of St. Gall, G-A-L-L, I might be completely butchering that. I would assume Gall, Gale. Gale, Gall, yeah. And uh, had acquired a preserved crocodile from Egypt for a display. I love that. Me too. Crocodiles are basically I will ask you, not to interrupt or derail us as I am known to do. Have you seen the, um, it's not a crocodile, but it's like an older dinosaur that they found that was like flattened oh, but yeah. like perfectly preserved. Yes, it was like all one. I think it's the coolest thing. Incredible. Yeah, so knowing that like the Egyptians were like let's taxidermy have crocodile. you know that kind of <laughs> vibe going. Yeah. That's so cool. Amazing. Yeah, I want to see pictures of that crocodile too. I didn't see any when I was doing my research, so that might be another one we have to uh, take a look at. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Um, so, further developments in taxidermy during the 18th and 19th centuries, moving through our timeline. Uh, one biggest contributor to the further development of modern taxidermy was the British Museum, previously known as the Montague House. Um, I do want to do more research on that, either me or you, because Mm -hmm. it was one of, I think it either was or was one of Britain's oldest museums. Mm. And um, as an American, Mm -hmm. you forget how old things are. Because things are not that old here. Because we're, aren't we technically in like our renaissance period? Like we're such, uh, yeah, we're such babies. Yeah, yeah. So, the museum was established in 1753, largely based on the collections of the Anglo-Irish physician and scientist Sir Hans Sloane, and it first opened to the public in 1759. Like, I cannot imagine a museum that's starting in 1759. I and still sound like an idiot, but I, th- I thought it would be a little older, considering yeah. America also started in the same decade. Yeah. 
I was thinking you were gonna hit me with like the six hundred. Two thousand two hundred BC. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. I don't know. Looking at numbers with seventeen in them always feels weird. I, let's like I always assume thinking of like American history, it starts in like the eighteen uh, whatever is mm. in your everything. There's no time before that in in my dumb American brain. So when things are older than that, you're like. Uh, yeah, it's, for me personally, it's anything before th- like fourteen hundred. That's fair. Because that's when you know, he who shall not be named decided to like take a boat somewhere and then oh. now we're here so like just anything just that asshole actually. yeah I figured that was coming up anything older than him I'm like dang that's old that's old yeah, yeah that's fair um, so the museum's expansion over the following 250 years was largely a result of British colonization and has resulted <laughs> in the creation of several branch institutions or independent spinoffs. Yeah. Um, speaking of he who shall not be named, this is where I'm mentioning him and how we want to do a highlight of how shitty colonization is. Yeah, go ahead and name um, that bitch. Just mentioning good old Christopher Columbus and how much of a piece of shit he was. Boo. I stand by that. We hate him. Yeah. No support here not in this house i'm sure uh, his name will come up in history a few times depending upon what oh, topics sure. we talk about and uh this podcast always supports christopher columbus slander he can go fuck himself yeah definitely all right <laughs> <laughs> we could go on that topic forever so moving on right uh by the late 1700s the museum had acquired and created the world's largest collection of preserved animals animal skins and collections which the taxidermy from that time is absolutely hilarious oh, um I'm sure. because <laughs> they did not have <laughs> They didn't have what they needed to make it very realistic, so yeah. I do talk about bad taxidermy a little further into my topic here, but uh, old-timey taxidermy <laughs> is so good because they're so bad looking. We'll definitely have to put up a way. few good pictures of that, yes. too, because it always gets me every time. Yes. Um, so after the fall of Napoleon, the museum continued to grow and continued to develop more modern techniques for recreating lifelike animal displays. Um in 1851, the museum hosted the Great Exhibit... Exhibitation? That's a word. Editing Eerie here. The word that we're actually looking for is exhibition. Featuring displays of animals from all around the world. I do want to look into that topic in the future, either you or I, because I don't know what was actually included in that exhibit. Yeah. So I'm curious to see what all they did, because that is a very cool idea. Well, what year was that? Um, 1851. 51. The Great Exhibitation is what it's called. Great Exhibitation. Yep. It's kind of like a world fair of taxidermy. Yeah. That's interesting. For sure. So speaking of old-timey taxidermy, going into the early taxidermy methods, the early methods to create animal mounts relied on using current methods to preserve animal and tan hides. The skin and hides were removed from the animals, the flesh was then removed from the skeletons, and then the animals were stuffed with cotton, sawdust, paper, and other materials, and then the skin or hide was stitched back up to place on the frame. So when you look at current taxidermy, which I talk about further into our timeline here, we have basically styrofoam molds right. or, mo- or plastic molds that are the shape of the animal, and then taxidermists will do the skin on top of that. But in the olden days, we didn't have molds. <laughs> Ye old times. <laughs> Ye old times. <laughs> Ye olden times. So a lot of times they would just use the skeleton of the animal really? as the mount. So oh my god! I know I follow a couple taxidermists on TikTok. Um, I'll have to include one of the ones that I like a lot in the show notes, but they can date when the mounts were done based off of what the mount is stuffed with. That's cool. Yeah, and with the newspapers too, when they're taking them out. No apart, way! They, can they see. Like, the see? Yeah, <gasps> that's really cool. It's very neat. It's very neat. Oh, that's the oddity I'm vibing with this week. The newspaper <laughs> clippings <laughs> some TikToker <laughs> pulled out of a dead thing skeleton <laughs> from 1852. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh! I just think it's so neat, and the mounts are also very heavy, mm-hmm. just because mm-hmm. they weren't modernized to be lighter. Yeah, so. for sure. Very cool. That's wild. Yep. However, because they're not using like a typical mold that was yeah, made in a factory jank. everything was less than perfect <laughs> yeah. jank is a perfect word to describe it so in most cases the animals no longer looked natural 
this is where we get some of our very funny old timey taxidermy. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the taxidermists that were working on it were challenged with recreating lifelike representation of animals they had never actually seen before. Because it's not. Oh my like gosh. You couldn't Google a picture of an antelope and know right. that when you're. So they were just kind of stitching the yes. skin back together and trying their best to make it look right. But it didn't always look right. Oh, heavens. I never thought about that aspect of it because in my th- in my head I'm like, well, you get the dead animal and then you start processing it, so you know what it looks like. But it's basically dead time Legos. Yeah. Without the instructions. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh bless them. They're just really trying their best. We appreciate that they're trying their best, but wow. Yeah. For sure. Wild. Um, So this led to some errors in judgment, which resulted in, and I found it very funny that Wikipedia put, resulted in epic fails in the the article (laughs) and included quotes Mm -hmm. around... Whoever the teenager was that was editing (laughs) that article that day, I want to say thank you Uh, for that. A hundred percent. Some of the animals were more cartoonish than realistic when completed. But the other fun part is the people viewing the exhibits also didn't know um, that it was wrong. They've never seen because they've never seen the animal, so they just you assume, imagine. Yeah, they just, just like that's what sheep look like for yeah, sure. Yeah, they're like that's a hundred percent. That's an antelope. antelope. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> and they were just a hundred percent. So with those epic fails, this <laughs> this had me thinking about current. Um, taxidermy that people do where it's bad on purpose. Yes. Because that is... The derpy lion it, comes to mind yes. so hard. Yeah. So I wanted to mention, um, I'm in a couple oddity Facebook groups, which really is the time of your life, because you're <laughs> scrolling through Facebook and you just see something very weird and you're like, ah, yes, I know what group this came from. Yeah. So I have seen some people basically take, like, possum skins and turn it into, like, a hood for a Barbie doll or like a baby so then there's like a little baby doll wearing its oh possum skin living That's its so best funny. life I also currently have bookmarked on Etsy someone made I think it's like a weasel or a mink into a slap bracelet no so they took the whole weasel or mink don't quote me on the animal and shoved a slap bracelet down it so that he's completely flat and you can slap it on your arm that makes me gain hope and to lose hope for humanity all at one time. And, like, that's just... that I did not expect to hear mink slap bracelet today. And I'm grateful I have, but also terrified. Yeah, that... Um, I do still have the booking, hopefully. So hopefully I can include pictures of that in our Instagram for Please this episode. Please do. I need to see that. Uh, that's so funny. Because it is a definite adventure. I also saw someone turn a straight, an entire hamster into a fridge magnet. <laughs> oh my god! I just I I want I, to is know. Is that better? Is that better than I, the slab bracelet? I just want to know who looked at a hamster and was like, "Time for yeah. you to be a fridge magnet." That's the I want that brain. That's kind of like very Tim Burton brain. It is very Tim Burton. Brain. I appreciate I, it. Me too. I I I can appreciate that for sure. I really enjoy sending bad taxidermy to my friend who's not very interested in oddities and kind oh. of ruining his day. Yeah. Um, shout out to Jared who <laughs> deals with with me randomly messaging him on Facebook with uh, nothing ruins your day quite like fridge hamsters. So. <laughs> nothing really makes your day like <laughs> creepy baby doll wearing the skin of a possum. <laughs> this is the skin of a killer Bella. <laughs> it's the skin of a- <laughs> Bella. Where are you at, Loka? Where the hell have you been, Loka? <laughs> Great. So, advances in taxidermy. So, this is where we start getting into, they're using molds now. So, you have your styrofoam, metal rods, wire frames start to replace skeletons. Do you know what year this is? Um, Or, like, around, I guess I should say. I'm sure it was... 18th and 19th century. Okay. Which tracks, uh, because that is around the time where... And I'll go into this a little bit in some other topics. There was, like, a an appreciate death phase of everyone's life. Where, like a macabre kind of moment? Where everyone, where like the idea was to make it so that everyone appreciated death more instead of it being like this creepy scary thing. Yeah, I can Which, appreciate that. I think humanity kind of goes in and out of that. Yeah, like, I definitely think we're in a we're scared to die phase currently. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Much like, you know, the Victorian era where yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. everything was creepy and macabre. Though they did not think it, so... 
our like the scene era after 9-11 yeah you know yeah. kind of the same vibe yeah very similar vibe thanks Gerard Way for that oh yes thanks Gerard Way god bless him god bless metal rods would be used to go into the styrofoam to make bone like support for legs heads and tails and then wire was used for delicate appendages and when I read delicate appendages like most people um I did not think oh it's a wing or something I immediately thought we're making wire dicks and that's yeah. not what it was talking about, but I felt it was important to mention that that's where my brain went, because I can't be the only one. I thought of, like, little fingers, like, they're, like, little rat hands. That's probably actually But then after you for. said, but I thought about it, my brain went, oh, I not I think the it's dicks. just the word appendage. Appen- I think delicate, read, you kind of, yeah. Reading Game of Thrones will do that to you. <laughs> the amount of times you read appendage. Yeah, definitely. Uh, to describe a, and or member. Oh, member. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. Just, you know, throwing that in there. <laughs> Uh, So moving on to the 20th century, so for numerous years the methods to prepare and preserve animals relied on burying the carcass into the ground and letting nature take its course in order to remove the flesh and bones. Um, As we know that takes a long time and it can take a longer time depending upon your climate, um, depending upon how wet the ground is, depending upon how you bury the carcass. There's just so many variables to- How much peat is in the soil. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. plant stuff, life noises. Life noises, Uh, yeah. Yeah, you had to move and now your dog that you were gonna unbury, you're not gonna get to unbury, you know, just facts of life, Yeah. facts of life. Um, So we started moving on to more, we're gonna say practical methods of, getting the bones in like an easier way yeah so one of those methods was boiling the flesh so this method would include boiling the carcass until the flesh fell off the bone while it was initially useful in preparing skeletons to serve as frameworks for stuffed animal displays the bones can get damaged and i i uh bolded the the bones can get damaged part because in any of those oddity groups that i'm in anytime someone joins that group and they post oh i found this dead squirrel Mm. and i boiled it the comments that are completely annihilating those poor people about how boiling the bones makes them more brittle is absolutely like you're like oh this poor this poor poor person person. (laughs) they just did not know so just mentioning people typically advise against doing it that way because it's not good for the bones Um, soaking the flesh so this method placed the carcass into a vat of water and then basically allowed it to soak until the flesh softened up so then it could be pulled off the bones. This method also required using tools to scrape the flesh off um, and led to damaging bones. Uh, The note that I have for this section is this feels very Toontown a la Who Framed Roger Rabbit (laughs) to me. (laughs) Yeah. Like dipping them into the acid. You know, I don't think anyone really wants to do that or deal with the uh, elaborate cleanup. And the idea is to make it so that you can get the bones in the easiest way without right. damaging the bones so that you can have as many as possible. Uh, chemicals. So this method is tanning hides and skins relies on using various chemicals. These same chemicals are used to dissolve flesh from the carcass and prepare skeletons. However, chemicals can also damage the bones and make them brittle. So this is where I wanted to mention people talking about bleaching bones. Mm-hmm. So in a lot of the like newer taxidermy groups, I always see people like, oh, I bleached the bones. And then you see another posts where they're talking about how the bones that they bleach completely fell apart <laughs> yeah <laughs> because it's not actually a good method to do it that way just because the bleach isn't good for the bones right in the 1970s there was a renewed interest in the art of taxidermy taxidermy competitions started to be held all across the country which i did not know was a thing no and i kind of want to look more into what that entails i feel like the 70s was big on like national competitions the 70s was just big on like everyone dying everyone doing drugs and taxidermy and taxidermy apparently apparently, and taxidermy and lots of orange and yellow yeah well yeah definitely (laughs) a flower here or there yep uh this was the first time that taxidermies could share their methods with each other and learn new ones that improved the end results because they found a community they found a community that's always nice that's what we're doing here an oddity community of Odd people. In the 1980s, museums started to use flesh-eating beetles called dermestid beetles to remove flesh from carcasses. I absolutely love dermestid beetles. I'm not going to go into a deep dive on them in this episode because I am absolutely obsessed with them. They are so cool for cleaning flesh off bones. I've talked 
to Serafina many times about starting my own colony. That is still in the works. When I do, there will definitely be pictures on the Instagram because I'm very excited about it. I can't wait to feed them things. So stay tuned for eerie grown domestic beetles because <laughs> I am obsessed with them. And this part of it I did not think of. When domestic beetles were more common, forensic scientists took note and they believed that the use of domestic beetles for scientific purpose and forensics could be beneficial. So for instance, if police were investigating a suspicious death where the body was mangled, they could remove the flesh and preserve the bones to determine what the cause of death was. Which I did not so, think about that. That's so, like revolutionary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know why I didn't think about... I wouldn't have thought about that either because, I mean, as a child who watched Bones growing up... <laughs> Um, the character that's obsessed with bugs and mm -hmm. uses them. I'm sure the amount of time he used those beetles, and you've talked to me so many times about them, I've never clicked that they were probably the same thing right. until right now in this moment. Yeah, and I didn't... I, I am obsessed with forensic entomology. When yeah. I was in high school, I took a forensics class. Don't so you love that our high school offered that? It was incredible. It's pretty um, cool. I wanted to go into forensic entomology so bad, but the body farm... Yeah. was kind of far away from where we live so i ended up not going for where it where is the body farm don't quote it's in tennessee i can't remember tennessee. where yeah. though i will definitely be doing an episode on the body farm please though. i yes. love that i love forensic entomology i would love to do a deep dive but yeah when thinking about domestic beetles i always just thought oh we're cleaning off like a raccoon skull here and there but using it for forensics absolutely makes sense yeah it's really cool. knowing that you could like look at bones and tell like oh that person got sliced Right, well, because then it's like, oh, this they got stabbed between T2 and T3 and not having to use any tool mm -hmm. to make any different mark. I mean, that's incredible evidence. Yep. So I read that and I was like, well, a whole other reason to be obsessed with domestic beetles because yeah. I absolutely love them. The little heroes. A hundred percent. So that's pretty much a high level overview of the history of taxidermy into modern day so nowadays i would say that taxidermy when we think of it isn't as common for most people at least i don't think it is i know being younger i think i always assumed that if you were into taxidermy you were a hunter i was gonna say taxidermy to me until maybe hmm. I don't know, start of COVID when you started getting into it was always deer heads mounted on yeah. walls. Right. Or like ducks mid flight, ducks. you know? Yeah, yeah. And like a house that's just nothing but like wood paneled walls. That's that's where I took it. Yeah. But when you you know, who wants to do that when you could put a mink in a slap bracelet? Exactly. <laughs> I have um, a very high appreciation for the creators on TikTok, and I will definitely be listing a few. Making TikToks of taxidermy, I think it's making it a lot more accessible for the younger generation, the youths. The youths. The youths, if you will. It isn't just hunters. Right. It's not um, just your grandpa's buck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and that... Um, you know, vulture culture is alive and strong. Vulture culture. Vulture culture. I love that. It's incredible. I cannot wait to um, be actively participating in it. So it's kind of rad that it's a lot more common with the youths. Yeah. Quote me. Well, because the youths are always a little weird. True. Not to quote our iconic Gerard Way from earlier, but teenagers do be scaring the living shit out of me sometimes. A hundred percent. And I appreciate every second of it. Gen Z is a whole other beast. Yeah, don't fuck with us. For sure. Don't fuck with any of them. Don't talk, yeah, don't fuck with any of them. I did want to mention my sources today. Obviously, Grand Old Wikipedia, we love her. I know they told us not to use that source forever in school growing up, but uh, Rid ridiculous. Wikipedia is love and life, and if you can donate to them to keep them up and running, highly recommend. That is true. I also read an article Article on bonesandbugs.com which tracks article by Kodiak Bones they covered most of the dermestid beetle information I believe that they do their own dermestid beetles don't quote me oh uh, like they're like an ambassador for them uh, and they like sell them yeah yeah groups yeah and that is the history of taxidermy do you mind if I ask you a few questions of course go ahead so um, we talked about why you shouldn't bleach bones. Yes. 
because it'll make them brittle. Make them brittle. Yep. But you don't want any brittle bones. No bones. Um, brittle. Is there now a newer method that's better for whitening bones? I know that a lot oh. of people just leave them in. So looking into modern day bleach cleaning, and I did remember bleach cleaning, bleach cleaning, bone cleaning, bone cleaning, and bleaching. Didn't mention in my notes, but a lot of people do degrease the degreasing method, where they basically take a skull and they put it in a bucket full of dish soap and let it sit yeah. and let the grease just come off of the skull gotcha. by a dish soap, and that supposedly is not. As is there anything Dawn doesn't do? Dawn does everything. <laughs> it saves little ducks from oil spills and it helps with bleaching bones. I love so, that. Um, hydrogen peroxide is another method that I'm seeing listed mm. here, which also tracks. Yeah. But the degreasing method does take a long time, and I have heard that it, it can take, like, days, depending on the size of the skull. And, oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Well, that's interesting. You know, how cool is it? That, it's very cool. That people living their lives and surviving has led to years on years on mm -hmm. years of... Art. Maybe solving people's murders, you know, yeah. later in the day. Like, just w these wild things. and 100%. I think that's wild. I don't think I had any other questions, really. I mean, I'm just so... Imp I mean, I'm just so impressed with the building I'm building of science coming together. And how cool is that? Thank you for sharing all that with me. That was really... Uh, that, was, that was really uh, nice to learn all those things from someone who doesn't typically listen to stuff about taxidermy. I can't wait to see what TikTokers you link because I have, ever since you sent me that crazy raccoon one, the first one of uh, the diva raccoon, Yes. Uh, they pop up everywhere now and yep. it's been a, a hell of a time. So we'll definitely have to link them as well. 100%. Um, so thank you all for listening to the first official episode of Oddity Arcadia. Welcome to the shelf. Um, Oddities on Oddities, we're here to create a fun environment of odd people where we can all be friends and enjoy weird things. And together. learn. And learn. And learn. We're 100%. both people who uh, probably heard too much in life. You always have to be learning and just completely internalize that. Mm -hmm. um, and continuous education is something that I really love. So, all right. Well, my dear Erie, thank you so much for spending time today teaching me about taxidermy. I really appreciate it. I didn't have any of that kind of background and now to know some of that stuff i can't wait to see that alligator that's gonna be so interesting so thank you guys for spending time with us thanks for learning with us stay on arcadia